Okay, welcome everyone to our webinar on carpal tunnel evaluation. Before we begin, just please be advised that all attendees are muted. You're welcome to type in your questions in the Q&A box in the toolbar located either at the bottom or the side of your screen at any time during the webinar. We will conduct a Q&A session at the end of the presentation and demonstration. This webinar will be recorded and available uh, archived for future reference. Our presenters today are Daniel Shelton and Bill Medford. Daniel Shelton is the director of our MSK market development for Fujifilm Sonosite. Daniel has spent 16 years as a dedicated uh, MSK sonographer, and 10 of those years have been here at Sonosite. Now he leads the MSK market development where he works to spread the word about benefits of point of care ultrasound. Bill Medford is the lead MSK specialist for Fujifilm Sonosite with 40 years of experience as a sonographer, including 22 years specializing in MSK sonography. Bill is an expert in using POCUS across the breadth of uh, MSK specialties. At this time, I'll hand it over to you, Daniel. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you everybody for joining us. It looks like there are still a few folks rolling in here. So what I'll do is just kind of open this presentation by thanking everybody for being here and thank you for your time. Um, we still see the numbers going up, but uh, just know that there's a lot of content in this slide deck. Um, a lot of it is just for reference. So when you go back to the Sonosite Learning Institute, uh, you'll be able to review a lot of the notes that are on the side of the screen where the origins and insertions are, for example. So I'm not going to be reading the slide word for word. I'm going to be discussing uh, basically what's relevant in that slide for examining the carpal tunnel uh, practically and quickly. So um, thank you all again for being here. I'll be doing the presentation. Uh, my name is Daniel Shelton again. And on the live scan today, we have Bill Medford, our um, lead MSK specialist up in the Seattle office. So um, displayed here is the Sonosite PX where all the images were taken for the slide content today. Um, keep in mind to do a diagnostic level carpal tunnel exam, it is recommended that you choose a clamshell machine or higher. And I understand that that can very much range uh, from system to system, but things that you want to look out for are color sensitivity um, and your frequency. So today we'll be scanning at 15 megahertz for the general survey of the carpal tunnel, and you'll see some images at 19 megahertz, but I've chosen to save a lot of the 19 megahertz images for Bill's live scan because I think it's most impressive when you're able to scan live. Remember, you have a chance to go ahead and ask questions, and uh, we'll save those for once the slide content and the live demonstration has been completed, but have those questions ready and type them into the uh, Q&A portal. On the right side of the screen here is the L19 scanning a, um, a carpal tunnel case with swelling. Uh, the diameter of this, uh, the, the internal circumference of this uh, median nerve is roughly uh, 16 millimeters squared, just to give you a reference. So anytime you suspect there's nerve swelling, go ahead and throw your color power Doppler on there and see if you've got any internal vascularity that would not normally be detected in a normal nerve, and it may just add to your clinical picture. Um, looking at carpal tunnel, it's responsible for over 90% of compressive neuropathies. Indications can be hand weakness, reduced grip strength, pain tingling, alteration in temperature and control of the wrist and hand. Other things to look for, besides swelling, there's flexor tenosynovitis, there's ganglion cysts, space occupying masses and post-surgical intervention complications like we see here at this distal radial fixation. So we have this big metallic artifact casting this huge shadow here over the distal radius. And look at the flexor tendons rubbing while that's not immediately within the carpal tunnel. If the patient is exhibiting those symptoms of some sort of median nerve um, entrapment, I would look at the surrounding flexor tendons and see what's, what's uh, maybe causing those to swell and flare and press against the median nerve. So it just could add to a further clinical picture. Having ultrasound is really nice because post-surgical interventions are not gonna cast artifact into um, the areas of interest, for example, like you would an MRI. We're not seeing that, that bright or that really black halo sign that we see in an MR um, overcasting the anatomy. First things first, any time we're scanning musculoskeletal ultrasound, I'm always telling people to start off scanning bones. Ignore all of the soft tissues until you see really nice bony landmarks and then work your way from the deep part of whatever you're scanning in MSK, work your way superficially so you'll never be lost. The soft tissue landmarks will constantly change 
in MSK ultrasound, but will, will not usually change much, are the bony references. So once you have a good foundation of bony references, uh, that's when I want you to start worrying about the soft tissues. So first thing on the carpal tunnel, we're going to find the biggest bone in the area is the radius, number one. Number two, we have the ulna, scaphoid, pisiform, marks our inlet, and you can see those labeled three and four. And then we're going to go to the outlet of the hamate and the trapezium. Uh, once you're familiar with those bony landmarks, then we'll work our way down towards um, where we're going to start scanning our, our median nerve. So in this slide deck, you're going to see a lot of notes on the side of the screen. I'm not going to read them all, but we are going to build a carpal tunnel today. So we're going to start with this 3D CT and we're going to work layers into that superficially so that we can better understand what the cross section will look like. So as an anatomy survey, proximally, we're going to look at the um, pronator quadratus first. This is a very large muscle and we're going to scan that and you'll see what it looks like. But that's the first level that we're concerned with taking a measurement if we suspect some sort of median neuropathy. Also traveling through the contents of the carpal tunnel, uh, but not a part of the proper carpal tunnel itself is the uh, flexor carpi radialis. So the flexor carpi radialis does travel up over the scaphoid, and that's very noticeably not a part of the carpal tunnel when we're scanning. But as you go distally through the carpal tunnel, you can see right here at the trapezium tubercle uh, how close that flexor carpi radialis rests up against the trapezium tubercle. In cross section, you'll see that it's actually sitting in a little tunnel. The trapezium tubercle has a little tunnel, and it's to house the flexor carpi radialis, and it is external to the carpal tunnel content. So just know that there is a little tunnel here called the FCR tunnel, flexor carpi radialis tunnel. It has its own retinaculum and it is not a part of the carpal tunnel. However, if your transducer is angulated um, a little bit too distally or proximally, this may look like a cyst and you don't wanna call this a fluid collection. So it's just something to keep in mind right there at the wall of the carpal tunnel, there may be a little black structure there. You don't wanna call that a ganglion cyst. Just internally, to the carpal tunnel content towards that is the flexor pollicis longus. Now the flexor pollicis longus is within the carpal tunnel but does have its own tendon sheath. So it is not a part of the bursal slash tendon sheath complex that we're gonna discuss in a minute, but it does travel through the contents of the carpal tunnel. It is a part of the carpal tunnel and to isolate this particular tendon when you're scanning, just flex your thumb and you'll see it move independent of the rest of the structures in the carpal tunnel. Next, we have the flexor digitorum uh, profundus layer, which is the deepest layer of the carpal tunnel. It's going to hug the floor of the carpal tunnel. And then uh, it's just superficial to that is the flexor, um, I went the wrong way, flexor digitorum superficialis. So they run in parallel and they're going to branch out to digits two, three, four, and five. Immediately superficial to that, we've got our uh, bursa slash tendon sheath complex. Now these are for lubrication in the carpal tunnel, but it can swell too. So if there's any um, excess volume in this complex, it will cause pressures that are going to press against the median nerve and may cause entrapment. Superficial to that, we've got the median nerve and it will travel through the carpal tunnel and there's variations of the median nerve and we won't go into that today, but I think you'd be really, really impressed if you were to look up all the different variations of the median nerve just how different this may look when you're scanning with ultrasound. So just be aware that this is uh, the most common appearance of the median nerve anatomically, but there are variations. This can bifurcate um, unusually proximally right up through the carpal tunnel and sometimes way back here at the pronator quadratus, uh, the median nerve can already be bifurcated and we'll look at one of those uh, here in just a minute. Uh, the transverse carpal ligament, it is a complex. Uh, it does have an origin, it does have an insertion and it is not just one big ligament. So this has been described to originate at the hook of the hamate, travel to the trapezium, from the trapezium, uh, jump over proximally to the pisiform, and from the pisiform, it will eventually terminate at the scaphoid. You'll notice that it does look complicated around the F um, flexor carpi radialis, and when we're ultrasounding, you're gonna see that it, it almost starts to group in right there with it. It does travel up and over the flexor pollicis longus and takes a sharp dive down, and we'll see a a very, very sharp pronounced black shadow separating the flexor pollicis longus from the flexor carpi radialis once we get to that on the live scan. Superficial to that immediately is a tendon called the palmaris longus. It travels right over the flexor retinaculum, but then branches out to the palmar aponeurosis. 
if you're fairly new to carpal tunnel anatomy, this is a really cool one uh, to look at superficially because it's also a palpation landmark. You can just place your pinky and your thumb together and then flex your wrist and you should feel a bulge right here at the wrist crease and that tendon is the palmar, or sorry, is the uh, palmaris longus. I went ahead and made that semi-translucent so we can see how it relates to the structures underneath, but ulnar to the palmaris longus and the rest of the carpal tunnel here, we've got another retinaculum, which represents Gaines Canal. Gaines Canal, um, its insertion port, uh, parts are the superficial flexor retinaculum and the pisiform. It is its own tunnel and has its own neurovascular structures traveling through it and its contents are the ulnar nerve and the ulnar artery. Now you can see that the slide just got a lot more complicated. There are branches of each of these afterwards. And for a future PowerPoint presentation, we will discuss more advanced nerve scanning, not only of the carpal tunnel and all of its variations and its superficial sensory and motor branches, but we'll talk about these other nerves like the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve and all of their little variations too, but that's not for today. Switching over to cross-section. So now that we're in cross-section, you can see the reference of where the transducer is located here on the upper right. So this represents a slice of where we are here. So if you remember back in the um, stripped away anatomy, we had the, we had the uh, pronator quadratus layer here. And that's where we're gonna start with where we're gonna begin looking at the median nerve. So here's where it's gonna be sitting, right over the radius at this level. Just over this interosseous membrane level, here is all the groups of the flexors before they, they really bunch together. Now we're gonna travel distally, just a little further to the inlet of the carpal tunnel. On the radial side, you'll see the scaphoid. On the ulnar side, you'll see the pisiform. So once I see the pisiform, I always look for the pisiform first. I then just pivot the transducer radially until I see the scaphoid. Once I see the scaphoid, then I worry about the angle at which I'm imaging the carpal tunnel. This is a very angle dependent structure and I have a visual on that coming up after we get through what the landmarks look like. So here you can see that flexor retinaculum traveling down to the inferior and anterior margin of that pisiform and the uh, most um, anterior margin of the, the pisiform where the flexor carpi um, ulnaris would insert too. So here's the contents of Guyon's canal and the flexor retinaculum makes up the floor of Guyon's canal and comes up and over the median nerve. And you can see that that median nerve is touching the flexor retinaculum. Uh, that's, I mean, there's no space between the flexor retinaculum and the median nerve normally. And then as the flexor retinaculum traverses radially to the scaphoid, you can see the flexor pollicis longus immediately hugging the wall of the contents of the carpal tunnel and the flexor carpi radialis sitting outside of that carpal tunnel. As we travel more distally, same thing, ulnar is on the right side of the screen. Here's the hook of the hamate, this big prominent shadow. The, uh, the ulnar artery is now resting on top of that hook of the hamate. That's another really good landmark here. And, and once we're in the live scan, Bill will discuss what's called the anatomical safe zone for um, ultrasound guided carpal tunnel release procedures. It's a really, really nice uh, landmark to be discussing um, this zone. So. Once Bill is live scanning, we'll remind him to make sure he's covering this really, really important view here. But you can see the median nerve has now changed shape. Okay, so it naturally flattens out. And that's why you don't want to call that the level of compression just because you see it flattening out. In fact, a lot of times you'll, you'll see a change in the shape of the nerve where it's starting to, to um, bifurcate twice, basically. I don't know if quadricate's a word, but that's what it's going to do. And it's going to turn into these other branches that eventually become uh, traveling over to the digits. Long axis is a very helpful view. Uh, it's not the most prominent diagnostic view, though, for entrapment because that median nerve does flatten naturally uh, distally through here. So what we use the long axis view for is not necessarily for measuring but we're using it to put the image into clinical context. Do we see swelling such as tenosynovitis? Do we see fluid collections, ganglion cysts? Where are they originating? Like you saw that post-surgical complication picture uh, pressing against the flexor tendons very easily. Uh, that's what we would use the long axis image for, not so much for measuring. Now let's get into some carpal tunnel scanning tips. These are key to getting a good image. After you've found and established your bony landmarks that we've already discussed, so here's our pisiform and our scaphoid. 
this is what most people land on, this big red one. And notice that the, the correlation to the slice on this MRI over here is that it's perpendicular to the skin. This is the most common uh, thing that I see when beginners are getting into carpal tunnel scanning is that they stay 90 degrees to the skin because they were told, hey, I got to stay 90 degrees to my structure. Forgetting that the carpal tunnel contents dive away from the probe. So what we have to do is angle the transducer towards the fingers or the handle, I should say, towards the fingers. And that should brighten up the internal contents of the carpal tunnel. You can see the superficialis layer and the profundus layer. In fact, what you're seeing is it separate, see down here against the carpal floor, something we didn't discuss are the ligaments. There's lots of ligaments that hug the carpal tunnel floor. Uh, and we won't go into naming those today, but they are anisotropic. So you don't wanna call this a fluid collection down here. You don't wanna call this a fluid collection. Um, Incidentally, here's the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor carpi radialis. And you can see how the carpal tunnel flexor retinaculum dives vertically right here. It's a very harsh dive. It's perfectly anisotropic. This is not fluid. Um, this is anisotropic non-reflection back to the probe. So uh, you can see the difference in these two images and how you might call this a fluid collection versus uh, the more 90 degrees to, the, to our actual target of interest. And this brings me to a point, if you were to tilt this transducer here, as we travel and traverse down the carpal tunnel, you're going to notice the shape of the carpal floor change, the walls of the carpal tunnel are going to change. So I, I did a little animation here. Through the ulna and the radius, we would stop at the pisiform, pivot the other side of the probe at the scaphoid, and then we're going to, we're going to angle so that we're following our structures 90 degrees distally. So here we have the hook of the hamate, trapezium tubercle, back to pisiform, and we'll let the animation finish back to scaphoid radius ulna. So use this recording as a reference and study your surface landmarks of your carpals and you'll never be lost in the carpal tunnel. Other scanning tips, when I'm scanning nerves or tendons or, or very, very small branches of nerves, scan in little one inch windows, little proximal to distal segments. Don't, don't just set the probe over the area of interest and be still. This is a this is ultrasound, so you're going to want to make it move. So anytime you can make anatomy move or scan through it, you're going to want to do that. So in this case, we have the median nerve resting over the radius. And all I'm doing, because this is a zone where uh, tracing the median nerve gets a little bit hard, it, it sets radial to the flexor tendons at the level of the pronator quadratus. So this can be, this can kind of give you a headache because you'll notice that the nerve travels upward when the nerve travels upward, you have to match that angle and sweep upward. So keep that in mind. Another thing is, um, as it travels upward, it may be highly anisotropic. So as we follow the, the median nerve, you want to just maintain perpendicularity. So here we leave the flexor tendon level where the muscles are, and we're traveling into the carpal tunnel. And you can just see how the shape of the nerve changes. Incidentally, a bullet point that I did not put here, but I'll go ahead and mention it now because we get this question a lot, is why is the median nerve so bright here? And why is the median nerve so dark here once we get up into the tunnel? And the answer to that is the overlying musculature in a healthy muscle is going to um, further enhance the sound wave over the median nerve. It's going to amplify whatever uh, sound is passing through there like an acoustic lens. If, if you're familiar with looking at fluid collections already like joint effusions, or if you're already familiar with um, abdominal scanning or pelvic scanning, what a bladder does is that it's gonna further enhance whatever structures are underneath it. Um, basically, that's what's happening here is relative to the surrounding tissues, the median nerve is now being over, I'm gonna pull the video clip back, go off script a little bit, but, and I'm gonna hit pause, but right here, this muscle is acting as an acoustic amplifier, basically, and it's enhancing the sound waves that are underneath it. So um, basically, this, this water-filled muscle, this fluid-dense muscle, is making the median nerve look that pretty. When you go superficially, you're really going to be burdened by your angle to get the best image you can. So now we're entering the carpal tunnel there you'll notice that the median nerve is much less impressive uh, in terms of brightness, and you're really going to be working on your angulation to get these this fatty epineurium and all the little fascicles, the walls of the fascicles to echo back because the fascicles are dark. Other things to consider, 
uh, bifid median nerve, which we see here, uh, persistent median artery, always throw on your color. Um, this is just a normal median nerve with a persistent median artery. Normally I see them together, but in this particular case, I did not see another bifurcation. At 19 megahertz, we have a video clip here where you can see both segments of the bifid median nerve with that persistent median artery sitting right underneath it. So this was taken with the L19 transducer. And notice the tendon detail and the intrafascicular detail we get out of 19 megahertz versus uh, 15. 15 is great. We, were, we loved 15 for a long time until we had this uh, 19. Another thing to consider is the mobility of the median nerve when it's in action. So if the nerve is being compressed, what's causing the compression? If I'm holding a coffee mug for more than three minutes, this, this squeeze and the kind of curl I do when I'm holding a coffee mug, my hand goes numb in about, um, in about less than five minutes. And this is the action that's causing that. So if I'm squeezing and curling, you make a fist and curl, kind of like we did with the palmaris longest action, but we're gonna squeeze and curl Watch the median nerve. Does it travel and get stuck between those heads of the superficial layer of the flexor tendons? And that's what we're seeing here. So it's just another uh, part of the story, just something else to try to paint the rest of the clinical picture. Measurements. We're gonna measure at the inlet of the carpal tunnel. If it is less than 10 millimeters squared, we're in good shape. If it's between 10 and 12 millimeters squared, that's where you wanna go back to that pronator quadratus, take that reference measurement. If the pronator quadratus measurement and the inlet measurement differ by two millimeters squared, uh, that's been reported as a positive indicator for swelling of the median nerve. If it is bifid, you can add the two segments together. A positive indicator is if both parts are greater than four millimeters squared. Again, long axis, long axis measurements have not been very reliable uh, for clinical um, decision making. Another indicator could be uh, transverse carpal ligament bulging, and that happens um, to be most studied down here distally at the most outlet part of the carpal tunnel, and that's where the hook of the hamate and the trapezium tubercle meet. Uh, incidentally, see that black layer right there? That's our flexor pollicis, or sorry, our, our flexor carpi radialis, uh, and it looks black. Sometimes it's going to look even bigger than that, but it's not a cyst or anything. But you're going to take a measurement, a caliper from here to here, and then you're gonna measure right in the middle. And if that bowing is more than two to four millimeters, it's been recorded as another positive indicator of swelling of the carpal tunnel. Um, I've got a quick reference slide just for the recording and for you guys to be reminded to go back to the Learning Institute and catch these recordings. And we also invite you to check our upcoming webinar schedule. These are happening uh, monthly, sometimes weekly, um, but the, uh, the schedule is constantly being updated and we invite you guys uh, to join us for the future scanning topics. That concludes the actual slides. We wanted to bunch all those together before we hand it off over to Bill. Um, so keep those questions ready to go in the comments section or the, uh, the Q&A. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bill Medford, and he's going to be scanning live from Seattle. This is live. So as you're asking questions, we'll be watching those. If it's something that needs to interrupt the live scan, we will interrupt Bill. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Bill. And uh, Let's see, let's see how the median nerve scans today. Very good, thank you, Daniel. That was an excellent overview of the carpal tunnel. I'm going to do my best to parallel Daniel's presentation in the interest of consistency. And so without any further ado, uh, we'll begin. So what I like to do is use a gel bottle um, uh, to place under the dorsal aspect of the wrist. That helps you maintain the, uh, the best angle to assess the uh, carpal tunnel as I'm working from proximal to distal. I'm gonna begin scanning by using the 15.4 megahertz, 50 millimeter wide footprint transducer, which gives us the ability to view the greatest amount of anatomy from side to side and proximal to distal. I'm gonna begin scanning uh, in the uh, short axis plane to the lower arm, beginning up proximally at the quadratus, um, femor, uh, pronator quadratus. Before we do anything, we have to select the transducer we're going to use. So I'm going to begin by selecting the L154 transducer. I'm going to use the, um, the nerve setting. Uh, 
I'm scanning the right wrist. So patient right is to screen left. And as you can see, we are up at the level of where we see the radius. I'm going to bring an arrow up. We're at work um, from deep to proximal. We're going to see the radius and the ulna. And then we're going to see this pinnate pattern of longitudinally oriented fibers of the pronator quadratus. It's at this level where we're going to identify the median nerve in between the two flexor muscle bellies. And it's also at this level where if we're going to look at the ratio of the median nerve proximally to the entrance into the carpal tunnel, to the inlet of the carpal tunnel at the level of the piece, form, and scaphoid. This is going to be our first measurement that we compare those area measurements to. I'm going to decrease my depth just a little bit to better frame my anatomy. And let's work distally now. As we work distally, we notice the central tendons of some of these muscle bellies. And it's important to understand that if your gain is set too low, this can look like peritendinous fluid. And to the beginner is sometimes misinterpreted as fluid as you get closer to the carpal tunnel. So make sure your gain is up, make sure you follow these musculotendinous um, zones proximally to see that that is not in fact peritendinous fluid, but in fact, just normal muscle. As we scan distally and approximate the carpal tunnel, we see the median nerve come through that tunnel, Daniel described, and come superficial to the muscles. And now we see here that at this point, I'm going to decrease my depth again so that we see again the median nerve. It takes on the honeycomb pattern. So characteristic of nerve, as opposed to the more bristle brush appearance that you see in short axis when you assess tendinous structures. If we work down, we come further, we come to the twin peaks described by Daniel as the pisiform on the ulnar side, the scaphoid on the radial side, perched on the radius, we see the flexor carpi radialis, and adjacent to that, the flexor pollicis longus. And if you have your, your um, subject or patient flex her thumb or his or her thumb, you can see um, it moving around there uh, relative to that um, provocation dynamically. Also, while we're here on the radial side, we see the the flexor retinaculum coming across and the deep dive that it takes back to its insertion and the resultant anisotropy that we recognize and, and do not want to mischaracterize as fluid. Here we see with a better transducer angle, the insertion of the flexor retina, retinaculum onto the scaphoid. Back to the carpal tunnel itself, we see the the deep layer of tendons, uh, the profundus layer, and the more and the superficialis tendons. And as we move more ulnar, the ulnar artery, the nerve, and the pisiform. So those are our proximal bony landmarks and the proximal con contents of the carpal tunnel. Again, remember that the flexor carpi radialis is external to the carpal tunnel. The flexor pollicis longus is internal to the carpal tunnel. Flexor pollicis longus has its own tendon sheet, um, apart from the tendon sheet that covers the uh, superficial and deep layers of the profundus tendons. You also want to recognize the um, very small but noticeable flexor um, or the palmaris longus tendon, not always present. Um, but most oftentimes is. Again, Guillain's canal, artery, I mean nerve, and artery. Let's proceed from the piciform distal now and the next bony acoustic landmark that we'll run into. Oftentimes we need to apply more gel as I'm having to do here.
little crease in the palmar aspect of the hand requires that you kind of fill it with gel. I'm going to give myself a little more depth at this point. As Daniel described, the structures go deeper as we proceed distally. So the pisiform, next bony acoustic landmark, is the hook of the hamate here. We see the ulnar artery. Now it's easy to, with too much transducer to compress the ulnar artery. So I'm letting up on the transducer pressure a little bit and working at getting the appropriate angle. It does get a little more difficult to get that correct angle um, as you're distal in the, in the carpal tunnel. So there we have the hook of the hammock. and the median nerve. And if you're entertaining ultrasound guided release of the carpal tunnel, these are the three struts you want to identify, the ulnar artery, the hook of the hammock, and the median nerve. And your transverse safe zone is that measurement between the ulnar side of the median nerve and the hook of the hammock and the ulnar artery and the median nerve. Whichever is less will define your transverse safe zone. At this point, I'm going to come, oh, let's go back here. And again, the hook of the hammock, your radial landmark then is the trapezium. And you see again here, the anisotropic, now a little bit lit up, um, flexor pollicis longus tendon. So at this point, I would like to switch over to the uh, L19 5 transducer, smaller footprint, higher frequency. So we won't be able to image entirely across the um, carpal tunnel, but this is going to be more targeted. A, a more targeted look and utilizing high frequency, higher frequency, we're going to get increased image clarity and greater confidence with what we're looking at. I'm actually going to go to the nerve exam type again to make, to provide a more contrasty image, which helps, which makes the, the darks darker, the brights brighter. It helps better define the uh, perineurium from the fascicles and just helps nerves in general stand out a bit more. So if we start out proximally, we see again here, it's very clear what is nerve and what is tendon if, um, down in the proximal carpal tunnel. Uh, we see the flexor carpi radialis there perched on the scaphoid, flexor pollicis, there, and if we come more, come more medially now, if uh, your patient can flex her second finger and her third finger, you can see how we can di differentiate each individual 10 and fourth finger and fifth. So isolating and identifying each individual 10 in this is really quite easy. Now look also how nicely that we can follow the, the um, flexor retinaculum as it courses over the top of the carpal tunnel. And as it comes and inserts onto the scaphoid there. If we proceed toward the owner side, we're now seeing Guillain's canal with the ulnar artery and the nerve come down to the pisiform. Again, the ulnar artery and nerve. And as Daniel mentioned, this is for another time, but we can follow that ulnar nerve up and over the hook of the hammock 
and see where it divides. And you can actually see the superficial sensory branch and the deep motor branch and a third branch here as well. So higher frequency, better resolution, more targeted assessment at what you're looking for. This might be uh, a transducer of choice also for establishing the transverse safe zone as we see here how easily it is to demonstrate the median nerve, the, the hook of the hammock, and establish the measurements important to be able to do uh, when uh, considering ultrasound guided uh, carpal tunnel release. Let's turn longitudinally, long axis to the, um, the carpal tunnel real quick. Again, you can better differentiate, you can better discern the characteristic sonographic patterns of nerve versus tendon with a higher frequency probe. Here we see the individual fascicles and their length of the median nerve, the underlying fibular pattern of the flexor tendon following down into the carpal tunnel. We see it taking its deeper dive. And now at this level, we can see as we're scanning short axis to the flexor retinaculum, quite broad from top to bottom. So we can identify the actual level where uh, um, the median nerve enters deep to uh, the flexor retinaculum and, and oftentimes see that thinning that occurs as it proceeds through the carpal tunnel. One other structure I want to point out as we're scanning distally is follow, following the median nerve down through the carpal tunnel. So we see the scaphoid, FCR, FPL, the median nerve. And we're going to follow the median nerve down. And as Daniel mentioned, as you get distally, it flattens out because it is beginning to get to that point where it is going to splay into the uh, distal nerve branches, uh, the digitorums. We see the um, trapezium there. And you see the flexor, uh, we see the insertion of the distal insertion of the flexor retinaculum, median nerve. We continue to follow the median nerve again. We see it flattening here and dividing into those branches, distal branches. Also at this level, if we direct the thumb side of the transducer toward the CMC joint and we assess that, again, an important structure to identify if you're considering ultrasound guided um, carpal tunnel release is the thenar motor branch, which takes off the median nerve vertically, right here. Median nerve, thenar motor branch coming up and ultimately to rest superficial to the um, thenar muscle. Daniel, what have I forgot? Well, that's outstanding stuff. Could you go back to the distal carpal tunnel and we're gonna clear up a landmark. We had a question about um, yep. right at the trapezium at the distal tunnel, let's wiggle the thumb and let's just clarify where that FPL is versus the FCR. So little FCR. thumb wiggle. We got a FCR there, the little oval, and then the FPL's anisotropic-ish. Just, just you know, right. I think I called the FCR the Yep. FPL there, didn't yep. I? That was yeah. the question. And uh, we got it cleared up on chat, but I, I just want to show people, you know, one moves yeah, and the right other right. doesn't. So it's just super cool to just make it move because, you know, we're, we're ultrasounding. There's Beautiful. the FPL. Beautiful. There's the FCR. And you're right. I called this the uh, F, not FCL, FPL here. Yep. FCR here. Perfect. And I called this the FPL. Correct. Thank you for correcting me on that. You bet. And right now, let's see, we've got a couple other open ones here. Um, 
Now, the we have a question about that Thenar motor branch. Is this synonymous with the recurrent branch? I don't know the answer to that. All right, we'll follow up with that. I believe it is, but um, and I've seen them referenced as the same thing, and especially the the lead up to a bunch of uh, uh, the slides that I was doing. I believe they are the same name. Okay, I don't want to. Uh... But if we find a yeah, different, I know something I don't, and in the interest of accuracy, an accurate answer, I'm going to say I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. If if we find different, I will follow up with the question uh, answerer uh, there. We've got any more open questions right now? There's no more live questions going on, Bill. But I got to say I loved that media nerve detail, and when I saw you in long axis, I could see where the transverse carpal ligament ended at the 19 megahertz probe. That was that was neat. That's hard to see on a lot of transducers. It goes so distal. Um, sometimes it's hard to appreciate how distal that transverse car carpal ligament goes. Yeah, it is. And and with uh, this this kind of frequency, you can make that distinction um, of where it begins and where it ends. As a reference, is that right the there. The, the bony landmark you have in the far field, which carpal bone do we have there? Uh, let me go a little deeper just to better define this. So this would be the capitate. Okay. Uh, where'd my arrow go? Now I've got two arrows, we'll use this one. <laughs> so we have the capitate. Let me and then the other, um, after we get to show that part of the retinaculum, could we show more details of the retinaculum, for example? Maybe let's start, um, maybe let's start at the scaphoid level and uh, go, go short if, after you get your long axis assessment wrapped up. But man, that's beautiful. I can see, I can see a, um, the median nerve and where it ends and I can see the transverse carpal ligament where it begins. Yep. Almost so this a, is also very useful if you're considering doing hydro dissection. Uh, to be able to see the actual retinaculum. I mean, we know that the median nerve sits on directly on the undersurface of the retinaculum, right? If you were but to be able to find the proximal side and the distal side to know where to guide your needle to, to perform hydro dissection of the uh, flexor retinaculum. Could you point out with the arrow, that big yellow arrow, where the retinaculum begins um, deep, I should say from, uh, let's, let's point out, I guess the median nerve there. And then where do you see the retinaculum begin and where is its most superficial margin? Okay. You get the image that I want. And again, I will also remind the audience that the, the scope of this particular talk is not the advanced, um, intricacies, I, I would say of carpal tunnel, um, advanced procedures. We will have one of those coming up where a lot of this anatomy is very much displayed. Uh, the scope of this presentation is where to measure, what to look for, the contents of the carpal tunnel. Um, and that will be one of our next questions, Bill, is uh, where do we measure the median nerve? So we'll do that next. Okay. So where you see the arrow place there is, um, is the proximal margin of the uh, transverse okay. carpal ligament or flexor retinaculum Beautiful. and the distal end is right here if I rotate the arrow. So yeah very easy to define proximal end and distal end to know where to guide your needle to if you're entertaining doing uh, yeah. a, um, an ultrasound guided um, hydro dissection of that ligament. And let's go on to the measurements, Bill. Could we take take uh, that 19 megahertz uh, for a spin on those measurement levels real quick? Sure. And maybe we'll do an inlet uh, and, and just use your arrow to show what we're measuring. Uh, I think the cursor and the dotted Cursors. line is going to be yeah. tough to see. Although I think on your manual trace, it shows up pretty nice um, on the software. Yeah, we could do that. Sure. Okay. So... We don't want to have our depth set to where we can see the radius and the ulna to be sure that we're looking at the pronator quadratus, right? So here I'm too low. 
they're on too high, right? We're, we're proximal pronated quadratus. We're looking for those longitudinally oriented uh, fibers, muscle fibers, uh, that penate pattern that you get uh, when you're long axis to muscle. So at that level, um, we want to get a good image of our median nerve. Bring our depth as such. It's pronated quadratus, you can see it deep there. Bring up my measurement tool. We'll do a trace. I'm sorry, didn't do the trace. I'm going to, let's try that again, Daniel, bear with me. Yeah, I noticed that the, the regular ellipse is kind of hard to see on a Zoom call, but that manual trace leaves a solid white line. And I've come to appreciate it where I, I actually started drawing things on the machine now with that. When I'm drawing a picture around some anatomy, I really like the manual trace, uh, hard line definition on the Sonocyte PX. You don't see that in all the Thank systems, uh, they, they all a lot of times stay dotted and you know can be hard to convey over a live demonstration on the internet for example but beautiful yep. trace there so bill there there you have a trace of it that's proximal that's at the level of the pronator quadratus so we'd save that image unfreeze and could you point out the pronator quadratus in that last view real quick that's a question in the portal there yep let me freeze pronator quadratus is this structure right here, bridging the gap between the radius bridging the gap between the radius and the ulna, ulna here, radius here. See how the fibers of the muscle are longitudinally oriented as opposed to this short axis, more starry night view that you get of muscle when you're short axis to muscle. So we have the pronator quadratus bridging the gap of the radius to the ulna from here to here, top to bottom. And then the median nerve between the flexor muscle bellies here. So this is the level that you'd want to freeze your image and then um, get a measurement. That answer that? That was perfect. So okay. now we measure the inlet view, I think, next. The second level is coming down distally. We see following the median nerve, we see it coming out of that flexor tunnel. More superficial now. Right now, it's immediately deep to the um, palmaris longus tendon. Could we switch hands? It's very small in, in my model right here. And then we have the flexor ret retinaculum, the median nerve. I come over medially. We want to establish the level of the scaphoid, scaphoid um, FCR, pisiform. And we're going to give ourselves more depth. We can even use the um, zoom feature if we wanted to, but I don't think we need to with this transducer. One request, Bill, I, I hate to make you do this mid stride, but could you switch hit for us and go lefty so we can see your probe placement? Is that still possible? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. I'm at the distal wrist crease. Uh -huh. I see that. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. So there's a scaphoid. All right. Yep. Nice. FCR, medium nerve, flexor retinaculum. Let's use that big arrow if you could. Sorry. That'll be hard to point where you crisscross your arms, though, I guess. That's okay. Piece form here. Okay. Older nerve and artery. Beautiful. Working over median nerve, flexor tendons, FPL, scaphoid, FCR. And right there is where we would then freeze our image and. and trace the 
the median nerve at its entry. Well, not to backtrack. A little too much coffee this morning. Well, not to mention you're crisscrossing your arms. Thank you for doing that. Uh, no worries. There we go. And there we have um, your area measurement down at, down in the carpal tunnel. Now, what I'm going to do for the attendees is just thank everybody for being here and for this webinar. We're going to conclude that as the main recording. Um, and, and I'm checking the chat window for any last minute questions. But um, for the sake of time, I, I do want to go ahead and make sure that we have a, a great stopping point for the recording so that we can start getting that edited and uh, posted um, on the Sonosite Learning Institute. If you go back to sonosite.com, uh, watch for the rotating banner uh, and you'll see a webinars link come up to register for future webinars. But um, Bill, I just want to thank you so much for that wonderful demonstration. Um, man, uh, we've we've seen a lot of anatomy today, but with the 19 megahertz probe, it's like a macro lens. I've, I've got to say it's probably the star of the show. Uh, counting fascicles is what we look like we can see right there on the screen. It's just stunning, uh, not to mention the driver. Great job, Bill. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time today. We're gonna we're gonna stop the recording at this.